Minister suggests this is not an effective approach to ensuring safe offshore drilling. Regulatory failures at MMS were made worse by the rapid growth of offshore oil drilling in the Gulf. Over the last two decades, the number of offshore oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico has expanded dramatically and extended further offshore into much deeper waters. Yet at the same time, MMS remains relatively small, had trouble recruiting qualified engineers and inspectors, and could not keep up. Though drilling has expanded in the Gulf by tenfold, the number of inspectors has only grown by 13 percent. The results, fewer than 60 inspectors are currently responsible for conducting over 18,000 inspections annually. The agency was born with a built-in conflict of interest. When MMS was created, it was given the dueling responsibilities of promoting drilling and collecting royalty payments on this one hand while also issuing and enforcing environmental and safety regulations on the other hand. It seems as though it was only a matter of time before these conflict and responsibilities would lead to the disaster we are seeing here today. In short, it was a tug of war between drilling and safety. As the BP disaster illustrates, safety found itself on the losing side of the struggle. Even worse, regulatory failures have been accompanied by ethical failures. In 2008, the Interior Department Inspector General found a culture of ethical failures within MMS royalty in kind program. The IG's investigation revealed that over a four year period, senior employees within MMS improperly accepted gifts and engaged in sex and drug abuse with all company employees. Unfortunately, this was not an isolated incident. Just last month, the IG released another report which found that inspectors improperly accepted gifts from all companies. Additionally, at least one employee simultaneously conducted inspections of an oil company's operation while negotiating employment with the very same company. In addition, in a series of reports, GAO found that flaws in royalty collections have resulted in millions of dollars in lost revenue. We can and must do a better job overseeing offshore oil and gas activities. Today, we will hear directly from the Secretary and Mr. Bromwich about how exactly they plan to implement the reorganization and increase oversight and accountability at MMS, which we are anxious and eager to hear. Before we begin, however, I want to make one final observation. While the Interior Department is responsible for regulating the oil industry, and they have been taking a lot of heat for that, it does not change the fact that BP was responsible for the safety of its oil well, and BP was responsible in terms of responding to the oil spill. And it is BP that is ultimately responsible for the entire cleanup and the cost, as well as the job losses and loss income resulting from the spill. I am committed to ensure, ensuring that the government has the authority and ability to effectively regulate the safety of offshore oil drilling. And on that note, I now yield five minutes to the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing. Five years ago, we began looking at failures in the Gulf and more. In, in light of Hurricane Katrina, we knew that this was a sensitive area and one that would struggle for years to come and one that was vulnerable to 
failures by the federal government in just an area or two, and whether it's the, the levees that failed to protect the people of, of New Orleans or the plan approved by Mineral Management Service that failed to even consider the possibility that oil could come ashore in a, in a disaster of this size, we, the federal government, have failed. Every day, every American hears somewhere, it seems, that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. There were two weak links that led to this disaster. British Petroleum acting irresponsibly, failing to maintain safety standards well established in the industry, failing to maintain their own safety standards, and being in too big a hurry to cut corners, cut cost, ultimately leading to the loss of life and the loss of billions of dollars to the American people around the Gulf and beyond. But there was another weak link, a well-noted weak link, one that this committee has been pursuing change for almost six years now from, Mineral Management Service, an organization that has checks and balances that mean nothing. Years ago, we discovered that when a contract was, was signed, person after person after person was required to initial it. They initialed it and nothing else. They did not read it, they did not verify, they did not ask any questions. That kind of absence does not just go to the engineers that are hard to recruit, it goes to the very top of the organization and has under multiple administrations. In fact, problems in our first uh, set of hearings go all the way back to the Clinton administration. But let us make it very clear those problems were well known during the entire Bush administration, and for those eight years, change did not occur. Sadly, Mr. Secretary, during the year and a half of your administration, change did not occur. I know that it seems like a very little bit of time, but if, if in fact, the 20 or so findings that have occurred by your own IGs and GAO had been put together with the work of this committee sooner and the urgency put onto it, I believe this could have been prevented. Having said that, we need to look to the future. We need to look to real change in the Mineral Management Service. I personally would not like to see it broken into three even smaller parts, but rather have the real focus, either as an independent agency or as one that has the, a level of clarity to the American people much, much more similar to the EPA. We need to have that. We need to have the American people understand that the proper revenue that has not come to the American people is a factor. The proper controls and, and safeguards are a factor. Chairman Waxman, Mr. Kucinich, and Mr. Towns, and the rest of us have all seen hearings, but we haven't seen the amount of hearings that we should have had, and we haven't had the follow-up by previous administrations or to date by your administration. I believe that there are a number of factors that we can deal with today that have to do with the current disaster, with a number of, of, of factors including a, if you will, an overstatement of available resources, an overreporting of available resources and when they were there, and a number of other areas. Those occurred under your watch. But ultimately, this is the Committee of Oversight and Reform, and it's those published 20 reports that we want to deal with primarily. It's the discovery of documents that will allow us to take a first hand in the reorganization to ensure that when this is over with, we can count on an agency that recruits and trains the kind of second guessers to an oil industry. I think it's important to note that there are many, many, many rigs that have been operated safely and responsibly. It only takes one operating irresponsibly and then a lack of oversight. In fact, to, the, to my amazement, the last inspection by Mineral Management Service of this rig before the disaster occurred as required with two individuals, two being part of the inspection team. That was because there was a requirement to have two separate people independently second-guessing each other. To my amazement, of course, it was a father-son team and, in, in fact, less likely to be independent. This is one of many too cozy relationships at MMS that have to change. This has to be an organization of professionals, not a family practice. The American people want us to take care of a number of items, but they want us to go further. I will note today that 
four other major oil companies have announced a investment and the construction of a very large dome designed to work in the Gulf, uh, certainly on our part of the Gulf, but perhaps in Brazil and other areas if a similar event happens. This kind of proactive thinking is important. And in fact, Mr. Secretary, to the extent that you've been involved in it, either by urging or demanding, I'd like to personally applaud you. I believe that when we look at the blow-off preventers, next generation, something that's been needed since 2003, and we look at the recovery and response assets, not just for this event, but for any event, for a major shipwreck, a hurricane that destroys a refinery, or even chemical failures, we all have a responsibility to see that we go with a program much more similar to putting a man on the moon than simply business as usual in the Gulf. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to an extensive hearing today. I look forward to the balance of our discovery, and I look forward to working with you on trying to oversee for over the next couple of years a real birth of an organization unlike the old MMS and much more like an organization that we can all be assured will keep the good actors doing what they're supposed to and the bad actors altogether out of the business. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Yeah, um, I'll also now recognize for three minutes the gentleman who is the chair of the subcommittee from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing on offshore drilling. Will Interior's reforms change its history of failed oversight? Uh, it's important that we do our work of, of oversight. But I also have to tell you that while I'm sitting here looking at the preparation for the hearing and thinking about how we're going to focus on things, for example, I'm going to have some questions, so you can think about it now, about the Atlantis platform, how 19 members of Congress wrote to uh, the uh, Mineral Management Service back in February, raising questions about engineering documents about question and didn't get the answers that we were entitled to. The um, breach and the catastrophe occurred with Deepwater Horizon, but the questions that we raised with respect to the Atlantis platform were, were, were relevant not only to Atlantis, but Deepwater Horizon and other uh, platforms that are out there in the Gulf. But as I'm, and so we're going to get into that in the Q&A. But, but I, I just have to say something about, um, about this moment. There seems to be some feeling in this country that we can endlessly invade the natural world without any consequences. Well, the, the catastrophe in the Gulf put the lie to that. But we still believe we can do it. But we're still moving forward with people, you know, talking about doing more drilling, and we, we built our whole economy around this. And, and so, Mr. Secretary, you're, you're being asked to, uh, to defend a system which truly is basically collapsing, really is. And I thank you for your service, but the fact of the matter is the system itself is collapsing. We, we think we can keep interfering in the natural world without any consequences. We think we can postpone the delivery or the development of alternative energies. We think we can keep on living in this country the way we've been living uh, without any correction in our course, uh, even in the face of a tremendous catastrophe in the Gulf. Well, we're going to have to start thinking again. Yield back. Thank you, gentlemen from Ohio. Uh, now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Michael, for three minutes. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Chairman Towns uh, for, and uh, Mr. Issa for convening this uh, hearing. I'm pleased to see the uh, Secretary here. Uh, there are some very serious uh, questions that need to be answered about what took place and also what measures we have uh, in place to deal with the, the current uh, spill uh, that you know I see from Florida around the, the Gulf Coast affecting people's life, the moratorium. We have, we've got so many questions, but I'm pleased that you're here. Uh, to, to hopefully uh, shed some light on it, your colleague. Uh, Mr. Isis stated that we, we knew something was rotten in the uh, Mineral Management Service. 
even under the Bush administration. And I'll put in the record a copy of a letter that, uh, that ci cites uh, three criminal investigations were launched during the Bush administration on that agency, uh, things uh, uh, we knew there, there were problems with. I, I'd like to know from you when you inherited that position if that was one of your focuses. There are other, uh, other questions that have been raised about the development of policy with the new administration. And you know, I, th I think a lot of people voted for uh, President Obama and the other side. They thought they were the protectors of the environment and all this. And it turns out that they were asleep uh, at the uh, uh, switch. Uh, and what, what baffles me is how you could come up with uh, proposals to and, and I want to know if you were consulted on this budget proposal in 2011 to cut the Coast Guard uh, budget, which is one of the first responders when you, whenever you have an, uh, uh, an oil uh, incident or a disaster in this country. Uh, in addition, $2 million cut from uh, MMS, uh, Mineral Management uh, services budget uh, for environmental reviews. It's in here. These were proposals. I don't know if you uh, had anything to do with this in February uh, of this year. And then uh, this is February. And then in March, the administration develops a policy. Here's the headline from the New York Times, Obama to open offshore drilling, uh, offshore areas to oil drilling. And it cites the, the Gulf uh, of Mexico. Uh, so here we're cutting the assets and uh, those responsible for oversight and permitting. Uh, and there are questions about the rubber stamping uh, carte blanche of the approval. This is the approval signed by your administration uh, to drill in deep water. And then the, the rush to go do more deep water drilling. This is the list of 33 approvals that by the Obama administration. There's only a total of 27 deep water operations in the Gulf, half of those are exploratory, half approximately production. But your rush to more drilling uh, and cutting uh, the assets. I think I'd like to know how this policy was developed and if you had any part in it or what the thinking was when they, uh, the when they took time this has expired. path. So I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, let me. Um, indicate that it's a long-standing policy of this committee that we swear all of our witnesses in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer. I do. Yes. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We're delighted to have uh, Secretary Salazar with us. Uh, He's serving as the 50th Secretary of the United States Department of Interior. Prior to his confirmation, Secretary Salazar served as a senator from the great state of Colorado. Before becoming senator, Secretary Salazar spent two terms as Colorado's Attorney General and served as Chief Legal Counsel and Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources in the Cabinet of Governor Roy Romer, welcome. And we are aware of your time constraints and we will respect them, no question about it. And then Mr. Michael Bromwich was sworn in as and to lead the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulations and Enforcement, formerly known as MMS. On June the 21st, 2010, Director Bromwich previously served as Inspector General for the Department of Justice and as an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York. Most recently, Director Bromwich was a partner at the law firm uh, Freed of, and, and, and Frank, where he specialized in conducting internal investigations. We welcome both of you. Uh, at this time, I ask that each witness deliver their testimony within five minutes, which will allow the committee ample time to raise questions and also considering your time constraints, uh, Secretary. Uh, of course, you know the rules that um, they start out, the light's on green, 
And then, of course, you know, because uh, you, you know all about these lights. And um, then all of a sudden, they I'm not caution. sure the Senate knows about these lights, really. Senate, oh, oh, that's another issue. <laughs> but then, and then all of a sudden, at the end, it becomes red. So, Mr. Secretary, you may begin. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman uh, Towns, and uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Issa, and uh, all the members, uh, distinguished members of the committee who are here. Uh, and at the outset, let me just say thank you to the committee for the work that it has done uh, in the prior years relative to putting uh, into the spotlight uh, some of the necessary reform efforts uh, that uh, are required of the Minerals Management Service, uh, many of those uh, which we have been working on uh, since day one uh, when I became Secretary of the Interior. Let me at the outset just say to the members of the committee, I know you are uh, all wondering about the status of uh, where we are with respect to the containment of uh, the oil leak out in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, since uh, day one, and today is uh, day plus 93, we have been working from uh, early morning till uh, late at night, making sure that uh, the entire arsenal of the United States of America is focused on the problem and getting it resolved. Uh, myself and Secretary Chu, other members of the Cabinet, uh, have been working on this uh, from day one. And as of today, uh, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there is a shut-in uh, that has occurred of the well, and uh, the monitoring that we have required of BP is uh, showing that uh, it is holding. Uh, but the weather patterns that we are seeing may have some interruption in terms of getting to the ultimate solution here, which is uh, the ultimate uh, kills that have to occur of this well. Uh, but uh, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Let me uh, move to the subject uh, area that uh, I think this committee wants to explore, and that's uh, the issue of responsibility and uh, what is it that uh, has happened here. Let me frame it for this committee the way that I see it. Uh, this is a collective responsibility, and I do not uh, believe that at the end of the day uh, that the blame game is going to help us uh, relative to how we move forward and uh, develop the broad energy portfolio and the comprehensive energy plan that is uh, required of America. That we need to work together uh, to uh, fix the problem, uh, make sure we learn the lessons from this incident, and that we move forward with uh, an energy portfolio that I think uh, at the end of the day uh, will include oil and gas. Uh, that has been the position of uh, the President and my position as Secretary of Interior. In terms of the responsibility for this incident that brings us here today, certainly BP and other companies that were involved have uh, broken the rules and have strayed from the best practices of the industry. Uh, many investigations are going on. Much of that has already been reported in the press. Secondly, uh, industry uh, has made uh, the wrong representations, uh, both to the Congress as well as uh, to the Department of Interior and, and others, with respect to drilling safety, with respect to the ability to contain blowouts, and with respect to oil spill response. The efforts announced yesterday by the four major companies and moving forward with a billion dollar effort on which I was briefed will need significant additional work uh, before we can be satisfied with at least one of those uh, particular prongs that I think are uh, essential to be righted. Uh, thirdly, the Congress shares a responsibility. This committee has been at the forefront, at least, of ex exposing some of the ethical lapses. But at the end of the day, uh, the drilling that has occurred and the deep water drilling has been something which this Congress has also embraced. And I recognize that I, too, was a member of the U.S. Senate. Uh, the passage of the 2005 Energy Policy Act, which uh, you, Congressman Ice, and others, members of this committee, voted on, essentially was part of a national framework. Uh, fourth, there is a reality that this is uh, an issue which uh, requires uh, looking back not just at uh, one administration, but it's multiple administrations. The MMS was formed in 1981, and you think about the fact that there have been Republican and Democratic administrations that essentially have allowed this organization to continue by fiat of secretarial order. And it was for that reason that even as uh, early as last year, I proposed uh, to the uh, Natural uh, Resources Committee, uh, sent, uh, Congressman Ray House Committee, that we move forward with organic legislation because the missions of this department are, of, of this agency are so important. Let me, um, so let me just say it's a shared responsibility uh, and uh, we need to move forward and, and fix the problems. I believe that we started uh, in my tenure as Secretary of Interior moving forward implementing the reform agenda, much of which had been uncovered through some of the work of this committee. 
On ethics, uh, from day one, we put together a strong and robust ethics program uh, working uh, with the findings of the Inspector General and uh, moving forward to clean up the corruption that occurred, occurred in Lakewood and other places. People have been fired, people have been sent over for cr criminal, criminal prosecution, people have been suspended, and we've done everything that we can uh, to clean house from an ethics point of view. We eliminated the Royalty and Kind program, which had existed for a long time and which had been one of the magnets uh, for corruption that has been eliminated. And we move forward with a comprehensive review and uh, change with respect to the Outer Continental Shelf Plan that had been proposed by the prior administration. And finally, we have uh, worked very hard to uh, stand up uh, the renewable energy resources uh, out in the oceans of, of, of America. Uh, with respect to what has happened since April 20th and how we move forward uh, with that reform agenda, it's a continuing effort. We've uh, proposed uh, and developed a report on safety to the President of the United States. It's a 30-day report that laid out a number of different measures from blowout prevention uh, mechanisms to moving with cement, cementing and casing and, and the like. We have proposed in the last two years' budgets uh, uh, efforts to, to, to expand the uh, number of inspectors that we have at MMS. And we're moving forward with the reorganization of the MMS now into the Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, Enforcement and Regulation. And that is being done under the leadership of Wilma Lewis and uh, Michael Bromwich. Let me just say that both of them have incredible uh, credentials as prosecutors as well as inspector generals. Uh, and they were chosen by me to run the agency in large part because of the ethical improprieties which this committee and which the Inspector General uh, had uncovered. And so we have been working hard on making sure that those ethical lapses are not there, and we understand that there's still significant reform that we have to undertake in the days and months ahead, and we will be focused on it like laser beam and look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Issa, and members of this committee to make sure that the new organization ultimately gets it right. Let me uh, finally say, I know some of you will have questions on the moratorium. I will be delighted to answer those questions. And finally, uh, just in terms of what I hope the legacy of this crisis is, I would hope that as we learn the lessons from this crisis, that at the end of the day, we'll look back at this time and we'll say that we have together as a nation developed safer oil and gas production in the outer continental shelf that does in fact protect the environment and protect the safety of the workers. I would hope that we can move forward as a nation and say that we have restored the Gulf Coast to a place that it's in a better condition than it was before April 20th. And I would hope that we are able to move forward and embrace uh, the new energy future of America with a much broader portfolio that includes uh, solar and wind and geothermal and all the rest of the portfolio that is part of the renewable energy initiative of President Obama and uh, members of this Congress. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your statement. Uh, Mr. Bromowicz. Thank you very much, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and other distinguished members of the committee. It's a pleasure to, to be here and to uh, testify before you and to uh, answer any questions you may have. Uh, as the Chairman noted and as the Secretary noted, uh, I'm new on this job. I've been in the job uh, exactly a month yesterday uh, as head of the newly renamed Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement. Uh, the change in, of name was made by Secretary Salazar uh, with a point, which was to stress and emphasize the regulation and enforcement part of the organization's mission that many people have fairly suggested has been ignored or neglected uh, in the past. Let me focus very briefly on, on three things that uh, we've been doing since I got there. Uh, number one, on the second day, after I was named director, with Secretary Salazar's approval, we created an investigations and review unit uh, within the organization uh, that will have several primary functions, but the principal function will be some self-policing. Uh, it will be authorized in conjunction, cooperation, and communication with the Office of the Inspector General to do investigations into ethical lapses, into misconduct, uh, and so forth. To my surprise, there, has not, there had not been that capability within the organization previously. I believe that any healthy and robust organization should have that capability. This organization now has that. Uh, second, that, that unit, the Investigations and Review Unit, uh, will spearhead an inf in a heightened enforcement program that will be focused on oil and gas companies. Uh, and that will launch aggressive investigations in those cases in which there are allegations that the rules have been violated. 
too often in the past, I have heard and I fear uh, enforcement has not been vigilant, it has not been aggressive. That will change. Finally, uh, as, as the Ranking Member and the Chairman noted, there have been many, many uh, reviews and investigations by various entities, including the Office of the Inspector General, GAO, and so forth. One of the duties of the inv this Investigations and Review Unit will be to follow up on those reviews to see whether the remedial steps that should have been taken and where statements uh, may have been made that those remedial steps had been taken, whether they in fact have been taken. So that kind of follow-up work will be a central mission uh, of the Investigations and Review Unit. Next subject I would like to talk, uh, touch on briefly are the new regulations uh, that uh, have already been implemented and that will be implemented in the future. Following the uh, Deepwater Horizon blowout and the 30-day safety report that the Secretary mentioned, a, a new safety regulation, NTL-5, was issued that is binding on the industry. That was followed by the issuance of NTL-6, which is a more environmentally oriented regulation. Uh, these are tough new rules and regulations that govern uh, oil and gas companies as they do work uh, in the Outer Continental Shelf, uh, and I think they are fair and appropriate uh, new rules and regulations. There are other rulemakings that are in process that are in part the product of learning that has gone on in the Interior Department. Uh, both previously and that is going on in an accelerated way over the last two months, and we hope to be putting out those rules in the near future. Uh, again, uh, I think we, we feel that those are necessary and appropriate. Finally, the Secretary mentioned briefly uh, the moratorium. One of the charges he gave me in connection with the moratorium issued on July 12th uh, was to conduct a series of public forums around the country to gather information on three central issues drilling safety, spill containment, and spill response, with an eye to gathering as much information from industry, from academia, uh, from stakeholders, from NGOs, from environmental groups, to determine uh, whether there are ways in which the moratorium might be shortened uh, uh, before the November 30th current expiration date, but generally to learn as much as we can on what additional measures need to be taken on those three dimensions to ensure that when deep water drilling is resumed, it is done in a safe and appropriate manner. Um, we will begin those meetings starting August 4th in New Orleans. Uh, we will follow those with a series of meetings in Mobile, Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, Santa Barbara, California, Anchorage, Alaska, Biloxi, Mississippi, Houston, Texas, and Lafayette, Louisiana. Those will be conducted uh, between uh, August 4th and September 15th with a call to report back to Secretary Salazar with the results of those public forums no later than October 31st. It is a lot of work, but it is a lot of important work, uh, and we look forward to doing it, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your, your statement. Um, let me begin by uh, Secretary Salazar. Will you commit today that the reorganization process will be transparent and this committee will be provided with all the critical details? Yes, uh, we will uh, absolutely be working uh, with the committee, with uh, members of Congress uh, relative to uh, legislation on the reorganization as well as uh, the uh, keeping you up to date on the implementation of the new organization. Now, the reorganization, I want to know how will the reorganization help to prevent further future disasters? Well, first, in terms of dealing with uh, some of the ethical lapses, which uh, I agree have been abhorrent in the past and which this committee has appropriately pointed out, as well as uh, our uh, Inspector General of the Department of Interior, we are dividing up the agency into different units. So the revenue functions of the former, what were formerly in the MMS will move over into a, an Office of Natural Resources Revenue. So the, the dollar collectors will be separated from those who are in charge of granting the leases and doing the enforcement. The rest of the agency, which uh, uh, Director Bromwich will oversee, will be split into a bureau that essentially manages the resource uh, out in the outer continental shelf, both uh, conventional as well as renewable, and another unit that essentially will be in charge of safety and enforcement. So that is the essential concepts uh, around the reorganization to ensure, first of all, that conflicts of interest are avoided in the future, the kinds that you have pointed out in your investigations, and second of all, 
that uh, there is a kind of enforcement with respect to safety and environmental requirements? Right. You know, um, the GAO and, of course, DOI, IG, have made numerous recommendations to improve royalty collection. Have you implemented any of these recommendations or up to this point? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the answer to that is uh, we, we have in uh, major ways relative to the elimination of the royalty in kind program. We are also looking at other ways in which uh, we can provide a, uh, a more effective uh, calculation of, uh, of royalties and have been working at uh, putting together a program so that the American taxpayer receives uh, the return from the royalties uh, or from oil and gas production that the American taxpayer deserves. Let me ask you, um, have you looked at the turnover process in terms of people that work for MMS, you know, moving on based on the uh, fact that they're so poorly paid? We, uh, you know, the, the revolving door issue is one that uh, has troubled us and one that uh, we are uh, working on. Uh, you know, it is my personal view that if you have been an MMS uh, director that you ought not to go out and then work with uh, uh, the, the, the industry. Uh, but I, I will have uh, Michael Bromwich, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just quickly answer that question because it is something that we have been focused on. Sure. I think it is a serious issue and a serious problem. There have been historical problems in recruiting qualified inspectors and many of the qualified inspectors do come from industry and then seem to want to go back to industry. Now, it is my view that we can do a couple of things about that. One is to create tighter rules to ensure that uh, if people who are uh, agency government inspectors do go back into the private sector, that at least they, they don't uh, deal directly with the agency that they just left on any of the matters that they worked on and for some period of time perhaps not deal with the agency at all. So that is one set of issues that we are in the process of addressing. I think a more fundamental issue, though, is how do you enlarge the pool of qualified inspectors? One of the things that, that I have begun conversations about is talking to some of the schools of engineering around the country to see if we can develop recruiting programs so that this becomes a desirable uh, public service career path. Let's recruit the best and the brightest out of some of the petroleum engineering schools around the country, people who have no prior uh, ties with industry, and let's make it a sustainable career path so that they're not tempted by more dollars in the private sector, but they can make a decent living serving as a qualified uh, inspector. So I, I had a conversation yesterday with the, the dean of the School of Engineering at UC Berkeley. He said there are a number of schools of engineering deans around the country who are interested in working with us on precisely this point. So we're at the very beginning stages of this, but I'm very hopeful that we will have some robust alternatives to the back and forth revolving door system that has existed up until now. That's very encouraging. I now yield five minutes to the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I'd like to do just a little technical housework. Mr. Secretary, your staff up until last night told us that there was a policy which they would not provide in writing that you only delivered document requests to the majority. And then the majority has been kindly making copies and giving them to us. However, under ranking member Waxman and the Bush administration, we never saw such a policy and we were not able to get it in writing. Would you pledge that? both the rest of the discovery would be coming, which you have already said before the committee hearing started, but also that, that the discovery would be transparent to both sides, that uh, the chairman may have requests that are slightly different than we have, but that what we request would be granted to both sides at the same time rather than relying on somebody to go through and try to make a, a, an effective copy rather than your knowing that you delivered both sides the same information. Uh Congressman uh, Issa, we uh, delivered uh, thousands of pages of, of documents uh, both to the chairman as well as to you, and we're working uh, with you to try to get all the additional documents. We no, sent a I package yesterday. And I appreciate your, your participation and your, your promising that. It was actually more technical than that. Until last night, any documents we got, we got because they were delivered to the majority and not to the minority, and the majority then made copies. And that's not a normal practice from government. Uh, each of us 
has independent requests, uh, and usually they're shared by delivering them either to the person who requested them, if only one requested. But in most cases, administration delivers to both sides so that both sides know exactly what's being delivered. This was troubling, and particularly when last night your folks suddenly changed in probably because you were going to be here and, and gave us both copies. We'd like to know that that would continue, that, that each of us would get information independently but, but copied to the other. Congressman uh, Issa, let me just say that we will uh, follow the process as uh, the Department of Justice and others have uh, required of the executive branch of government. My view is that uh, transparency is important. Uh, we have provided tremendous documents uh, to this committee and we'll continue to work with you to provide you the information that you need so that uh, you have uh, absolute information relative to what it is that you're seeking. Okay, I, I won't belabor the point. I'll trust that if you gave it to us directly last night, you're probably going to continue giving it to us directly uh, and not the way your staff had decided to do it prior to that time. Uh, the, uh, the questions uh, I have are a number, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, the, uh, the culture at MMS, we can talk about changing, Mr. Bromwich. I, I'm looking forward to your helping change that. But in our earlier investigations, one of the things we discovered was that not only was this organization cozy, it was inept. We had testimony and evidence that you're now what you own, or maybe what you own, Mr. Secretary, the portion that was collecting the money completely relied on the energy companies to deliver how much was owed from where, that there was no independent accounting and that no audit ever basically found a different number, meaning if uh, Kerr McGee, when they were still in business, said we got X amount out and delivered X amount of dollars, they just took the money and, and recorded it, that they had no independent ability to know whether that was the right number or not. Do you, one or both of you, have plans to implement a system so that you can independently discover how much oil or natural gas or other resources are being taken out? and verify them, not just take the word of the good players and the bad players alike? The answer to that, Congressman I is yes, and uh, we have already done it in, indeed with uh, BP. We just sent them a notice for some, I think, $5 million uh, with respect to royalty underpayments uh, in, uh, on an onshore activity. And secondly, with respect to the Office of Natural uh, Resource uh, Revenue, which uh, we have created, uh, there will be the auditing uh, function so that we can do that independent verification, and perhaps Director Bromwich may want to comment on that as well. I agree with you, uh, Congressman Issa. That's, a, that's an inappropriate and unacceptable system. The uh, Secretary has just said that that's been changed and that that's absolutely the right way to do it. You cannot re rely on the regulated entity to report without checking that, auditing it, and coming up with an independent assessment. I appreciate that. And very quickly, uh, the uh, – I, I might suggest that uh, every year the Army Corps of Engineers has huge amounts of senior engineers retire who still would like to work for government. I would hope that you look at both ends of the spectrum, those coming directly out of uh, universities that have never worked with oil companies, but perhaps senior engineers who have uh, 5, 10, or 15 more good years to give that also do, are not tainted by an ambition to work for seven figures for an oil company. I think that's a great idea. Last week I found out that there may be a pool of people in the Coast Guard, I think they're called warrant officers, who similarly have uh, useful experience that we, yeah. can, we can count on. So I think there are actually pockets of experienced personnel all over government uh, that people just haven't thought of tapping into in the past, but that we're going to try to tap into now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now yield to the the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I indicated in my opening remarks that I had some questions about the uh, way that the Minerals Management Service handled the uh, British Petroleum's Atlantis platform uh, issues in the Gulf of Mexico. I was one of 19 members of Congress who signed a letter to uh, the Mineral Management Service uh, back in February of 2010. Uh, this was about uh, Mr. Bromwich. This was uh, about two months before the Deepwater Horizon incident. Uh, Ms. Birnbaum, the former director, received a letter uh, about BP Atlantis's platform. 
we requested an investigation to verify a whistleblower claim that 90 percent of the final construction plans for the platform, almost 7,000 plans, were never approved. So if there is an accident in that rig, there would be no plans for response teams to use to try to deal with it. Uh, though I am happy to see that an investigation is now underway, I am concerned that it is not expected to conclude until September. It's important to keep in mind that this platform is in waters deeper than the deep water horizon platform. And BP's own worst case scenario for a catastrophe with Atlantis would put over 200,000 barrels of oil per day into the Gulf, which is about f anywhere from four to ten times the size of the Deepwater Horizon catastrophe. My first question, Mr. Bromwich, is whether BP would be found in violation of the law if it does not maintain certified as-built drawings on file. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Let me get back to you on that. My intuition is, I, that, the answer, my intuition that, is that the answer. I'm disappointed you don't have the answer to that because that's your job. The answer, I'll give you the answer. The answer would be yes. Now, I'm told that it should not take that long to review the plans. That raises a question that the plans might not even exist. I'm concerned that Atlantis is the rule and not the exception. Given what we know about the Horizon accident and how BP Atlantis does not have engineer certified documents for its subsea components as required by law, wouldn't it make sense for the Bureau for Ocean Energy Management, Regulation and Enforcement to close the Atlantis project as well as any deep water drilling production operations in the Gulf that lack final plans until an independent third party has proven that they're operating with complete sets of engineer approved drawings for their above and below sea components. Mr. Bromwich. Uh, Congressman, you are correct that there is an investigation uh, ongoing. Uh, you are also correct that it is going to be completed by the end of September. Uh, I am advised that there is a letter that is on its way to me that will update you and other members, uh, interested members of the committee with what I anticipate will be preliminary results of that investigation. The truth is I have spent the bulk of the month uh, since I came on board dealing with various offshoots of the Deepwater Horizon matter, and so I am not as fully aware of the Atlantis matter as you would like me to be, but I will make it my business to become more knowledgeable about it and be happy to talk to you further about it in the near future. Uh, Mr. Bromwich, I appreciate that response, but I think it would be useful for you to review the letter that was sent back in February, February 20, 2010, signed by 19 members of Congress, including myself which provides a very powerful warning about the consequences of not having uh, an appropriate inspection of the issue relating to engineering plans at that uh, BP Atlantis platform. I will review that. You, you understand the concern. I mean, we, we're deal you are dealing with a catastrophe from the lack of appropriate oversight at Deepwater Horizon. What I'm maintaining to you and what other members of Congress have, jo we've all joined together in asserting is that uh, lack of appropriate oversight also exists with respect to a BP Atlantis platform, which could have even more catastrophic uh, implications uh, than uh, the uh, Deepwater Horizon disaster. I thank the gentleman. I yield back. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman uh, Kucinich, I would uh, want to just uh, supplement to what uh, Director Bromwich said by saying, one, uh, the investigation is underway and he will uh, keep you uh, posted as to the results of the investigation. Number two, we have uh, sent inspectors uh, out into the Gulf to look at uh, the uh, drilling uh, as well as the production uh, platforms and so there is an ongoing inspection effort underway. And number three, one of the things that should come out of the lessons learned here is that you cannot have uh, 60 inspectors essentially having the responsibility of conducting the massive uh, job that has been assigned uh, to these inspectors. And that is why there is a budget amendment in front of this Congress to try 
to beef up uh, the level of, of, of inspection and, and investigation capability within Mr. the agency. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want this committee to be on notice that we've got to find out whether BP has certified as built drawings on file. This is a this is a serious matter, especially in light of Deepwater Horizon. Thank you. Right. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Micah. Thank you. Uh, again, we appreciate your being here, Mr. Secretary. I raised some questions in my couple of minutes of opening statement. Um, and I think everyone has to be baffled by the administration's development of policy. You were one of the first people nominated, I think, by, back by the president. People were pleased. You know, we had somebody from the Congress and your experience in the position. So you came in in 2009. You had an opportunity to develop bu budget and policy, I would imagine. And um, I, I was kind of shocked again when the staff gave me the budget. And uh, it showed cuts like $2 million in the mineral management environmental permit activity that, that was proposed by your agency. Did you participate in making decisions on that? Or uh, again, the, the primary agency for response in these kinds of disasters would be the Coast Guard. Uh, the administration proposed 1,100 uh, positions cut, cutting assets, uh, ships, planes, helicopters, all the things that you would use uh, in a response. W were you part of the decision to make those cuts? either in your agency, uh, maybe not Coast Guard? You know, Congressman Micah, with respect to uh, the budget that had been submitted to MMS, uh, you will, if you look at the 10-year history of the budget, uh, there had been uh, erosion uh, within the Department of Interior MMS as well as with but, all. But you were proposing. Well, let me, let me, let me just yeah, finish with respect to, to the rest of the other agency, agencies within Interior, including MMS, a very significant erosion until we came on board. Now, you will, note, you will note that the inspectors that are set forth in the budget for MMS are a significant increase from what had been there in the past. Now, the question that is appropriate, I think, for this committee and for the Congress, is that number sufficient? And in our view, it is not. We need well, to have again, additional capacity. All I can go is by the budget. I asked if you were there when the decision was made to cut the environmental uh, review uh, activities, which also reviewed uh, permits. and then. The next thing is that this is fe this is February. It came out in March. Uh, did you participate in the decision to expand drilling in the Gulf and other areas? The uh, were you the, consulted? Is there any documentation? Is it was my it, not that I was consulted. It was my decision and it was my plan. And it's okay. a plan that I am very that that it was a very well thought out plan relative to moving forward in a thoughtful way that changes the direction that we are going on in the OCS, that does different things with yeah. respect to what was being planned on the well, Atlantic and, and, the, and, and does different things that was being planned in Alaska and brings in the kinds of environmental reviews that are necessary. Well, again, um, let's go to that, though. You were there when they issued this one-page permit, uh, and this is the permit to drill uh, for BP, one page. This is